You're listening to The Foundation of Wellness, a refreshing take on diet and lifestyle with Jessica Dogert, a registered dietitian nutritionist, and Marisa Moon, a primal health coach. Hey, you guys. My name is Jessica, and I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist, and you can learn all about me on my website at jessicadogert.com. Hey, what's going on, you guys? This is Marisa Moon. I am a certified primal health coach, and I create recipes at mylongevitykitchen.com, and you can find my coaching stuff at marisamoon.com. So today's episode is episode 35, and it's all about fermented foods. I think it's pretty safe to say that Marisa and I love to talk all about gut health. We recorded a three-part series on the gut when we first started this podcast, so make sure you check out episodes three, four, and five. I mean, gut health is everything. I've said this before, but one of my favorite quotes is, all disease begins in the gut, so we better take care of it. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I love that we're talking about fermented foods because it's a topic that a lot of people are unfamiliar with today. And It's a food group that is so critical for our long-term health and one that I really have grown to love so much. And our gut is one of the reasons that it's so critical to include this food group. And we are going to share a lot more reasons than that today. Yes, we are. So to start off, I think I should just review what the gut microbiome is. And it's a complex ecosystem of bacteria and fungi and yeast that we develop after birth. And these trillions of microbes live in the intestinal tract. Yeah, there are a lot of them in our entire body. I mean, bacteria outnumber our human cells more than 10 to 1. And the vast majority of those bacteria are in our intestines. And the gut microbiome contains both good and bad bacteria. And when the balance is tipped toward bad bacteria, which can be due to so many things like diet and infections, even lack of sleep and stress, it often affects digestive health and overall well-being. So that is why one supplement I recommend across the board is probiotics. So consuming certain probiotics can help this whole gut situation by providing a regular source of friendly bacteria or good bacteria to the GI tract, improving how it functions. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I mean, I don't think probiotics make up for an absence of fermented foods in the diet, But regardless, I think that we will all benefit from different types of probiotic supplements and making that a regular part of our routine. I mean, these beneficial bacteria work by essentially out-competing the nasty pathogens for space and food inside our GI tract. You know, the world of microorganisms is so vast and so complex and miraculous that scientists are always discovering new things and they could be discovering new benefits forever and ever and ever. So true. So what are some of the benefits of getting more probiotics in our body by consuming fermented foods and probiotic supplements? Well, as we mentioned, two major benefits are gut health and immunity. In fact, about 80% of your body's immune tissue is located in the gut, so it's heavily influenced by the bacteria living there. But Mm. these beneficial bugs, they've been linked to so much more than just better digestion and immunity. Optimizing your gut with probiotics can also help boost your mood and energy levels and reduce inflammation and cravings and support that healthy immune system. You know, probiotics and fermented foods boost your mood and lower anxiety. You know, some scientists call the gut the second brain and for good reason, because 90% of serotonin, the neurotransmitter that balances our mood, is actually produced there. Ugh. I hear that all the time now. I think it's becoming more and more widely accepted that really our gut is our second brain. That's fascinating. It's the coolest thing. And a 2015 study of 700 students discovered that those who ate fermented foods regularly had less social anxiety. And an earlier study found that women who consumed probiotic-rich foods, aka fermented or cultured foods, every day for a month were better able to keep their moods and emotions in check than the control group. 
Oh, man, that means I could have saved my marriage from a lot of fights if I would have just ate more fermented foods exactly. during my cycle. <laughs> Sorry, Eric. Thanks for putting up with me. <laughs> he loves you. You guys, I'm so obsessed with all things brain health. And last April, Marissa and I met Dr. Perlmutter at Paleo FX, and he's truly one of my favorite people on earth. He's a neurologist who's really my go to guy for knowledge and research, and he's the author of best selling books, Grain Brain and Brain Maker. Yeah, those are both awesome books. I read Grain Brain and I listened to Brain Maker on Audible, but you know, Grain Brain is all about how carbohydrates affect the brain and raise our risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. And that book will scare the bread right off your plate. It's pretty extreme, but maybe that's what we need to make such a dramatic change like he is suggesting. Um, but Brain Maker is all about the toxins and the nutrients that come together to affect how your brain develops throughout your life and your brain health, you know. And in, in this book, Brain Maker has a strong emphasis on the importance of probiotics and fermented foods for your brain. So I'm glad you brought it up, Jessica. It's a timely book that we all need right now so that we, we, we can just wake up to the power of beneficial bacteria. And on Abel James' podcast, The Fat Burning Man Show, Dr. Perlmutter talks about healing the gut to treat depression. And he says when we target the gut bacteria and overall inflammation, that's when we are going to see powerful changes in terms of mood. So we fix people's gut bacteria as an intervention for depression. And in the journal Gastroenterology, there's a study where one group got a probiotic yogurt, one a regular yogurt, and one a placebo. And after four weeks, the groups were shown photos of threatening faces and given a functional fMRI, which views areas of the brain that are active. And the probiotic group had a lesser response. So what does that mean? It means that consuming fermented foods actually changed how these people responded to the world around them. We are now treating brain disorders and dementia and autism, even skin issues and asthma, all by targeting the gut and gut bacteria. That is powerful stuff. For real. It makes me want to look at that study that you quoted or Dr. Perlmutter quoted in the Journal of Gastroenterology because let's think about that. He said one group got probiotic yogurt and one group got regular yogurt and one a placebo. So what does he mean by regular yogurt? I'm thinking he means there's a lot of junk cheap yogurt out there that doesn't even have any live active cultures left in it when they package it and sell it to you in the store. And maybe that means the probiotic yogurt, they either added probiotic powder to it to enhance the culture content, or they just found one that was more alive. So I always tell people, like we'll talk about later, when you're looking for yogurt, you want to make sure it has live active cultures. And they will usually list that on the label somewhere, if not in the ingredient list, they're bragging about the active cultures somewhere, right, Jess? Oh, exactly. I mean, and marketing is king here too. You know, if you pick up a yogurt and it says full of live active cultures, you definitely want to flip over and read the ingredient list to make sure you are indeed getting those active cultures and all of that good stuff. So I also read a really interesting article in a biology journal, and the main gist was just to blame your gut bacteria for your food cravings. And the background was that bad bacteria in our gut, it can cause cravings in powerful ways. I mean, all this bacteria is going to affect your mood. It's going to change our taste buds. It's going to influence our hormones. It just hijacks signals to our brain. So cravings, they might not just be a matter of willpower. Instead, they can be a direct order from the army of bad bugs in our gut. Yeah, let's think about that for a sec. Because you and I both know, Jess, that when you first learn about this, it's like a major mind-blowing situation. You see, the trillions of bacteria and microbes that are in our bodies are theorized to actually run the show, okay? Like, we're the host, and they're just using us for their own agenda. Bacteria and microbes existed long before the Earth's atmosphere even existed, okay? <laughs> they made food with carbon dioxide in the sun. They didn't need oxygen. They created oxygen. They created an environment that would soon support life as we know it today. <laughs> That's crazy. 
And all they really care about, these microbes, all they really care about are their own needs. And that's why there's a constant battle inside our gut for who's going to take over, who's going to take up the most food and the most space, who's going to win, who's going to conquer. And so by triggering cravings and behaviors in us, their host, they can manipulate us to get more of what they want. Like pathogens want more sugar, but beneficial bacteria want more fiber and more nutrients. This is one of the reasons that if you don't like healthy food right now, you will develop a taste for it. You will literally starve out the bad guys, stop craving so much sugar, and you'll feed the good guys, start craving healthier foods like I seriously get excited to eat a salad, and you'll help the good guys get, grow in population and take over your gut like they should be. Oh my gosh, mic drop. It's so true. It's like, <laughs> I, I genuinely do think though, like not to brag about the, the, both of us, but like the healthier you do become, the more you crave those healthier foods that you might not have craved, you know, Absolutely. years ago. For sure. So that's exactly why we want to build a better army of good bacteria in our gut. And that's by adding a daily dose of healthy bacteria with fermented foods and probiotics, right? Yeah. We, we got to remember though, also bacteria aren't only important in our GI tract though they're they're also important in our food on the earth like the soil um, in our mouths on our skin yeah I mean everyone's starting to get hip to the idea that antibiotic use is out of control especially when we think about how many people and doctors are turning to antibiotics when they're not necessarily appropriate for the treatment and and how much antibiotics we put in the feed when we're raising animals in factory farms. Everyone's kind of understanding that that's a problem. But I want you to think about this, that we also kill all the good bacteria that's in our water, in our soil. Um, we use antibacterial hand soaps and lotions, killing the bacteria on our skins. Um, we use mouthwash that kills all the healthy bacteria in our mouth and we sterilize our food by pasteurizing it and and all of this is is advertised as something good like we're killing 99.9 percent .9 of bacteria but the problem is we're killing some of the good ones the ones that protect us from the dangerous bacteria the if we keep up this habit of just wiping out all bacteria and being totally indiscriminate then you know we're not actually making ourselves healthier or less vulnerable to infection by using all that pure all antibacterial hand stuff. We, we actually end up making ourselves more vulnerable to infection. It's crazy. Last year at Halo FX, Marisa and I both bought this product called Mother Dirt, and it was this kind of like probiotic spray that would actually put bacteria, good bacteria back onto your skin. Because basically yep. like what Marisa said, I mean, we're washing ourselves of all this good bacteria. So we need to replace it, right? I'm obsessed with that product, Mother Dirt. Yeah, really smart, really smart. So let's talk more about fermented foods. First of all, I recommend eating at least one fermented food per day. Oh, same here. I love that you said that, per day. I mean, it's not... A quantity. It's just like, get it in, you know? I mean, food and beverage fermentation are these ancient rituals that humans have been performing since literally the dawn of mankind. But today, fermentation is like a completely foreign concept in most households, most communities. And I can speak for Americans when I say that this is really something foreign to most of us. But all over the world, cultural and traditional societies still living today are consuming fermented foods at every single meal. I mean, let's think about popular and traditional fermented foods. They include vinegar and pickles and sauerkraut and kimchi and yogurt and so many different cheeses and salami, kombucha, kefir, and, and so much more. If Americans would just eat more fermented foods, we would have a stronger gut, a more intelligent brain and a stronger immune system yes but i imagine even the concept of fermenting foods is somewhat new or even unfamiliar to many of our listeners so let's start with a little definition fermentation is a process that helps to preserve foods yeah i mean most of human life existed without refrigerators right no freezers not even ice so before electricity made refrigeration like a normal household thing, fermentation was one of the best means of preserving food. Everyone dehydrated their food to preserve it or they fermented it. Simple enough. And when foods are fermented, bacteria or yeast are introduced to break sugars down into other molecules like alcohols and acids. And this process can be as simple as placing vegetables in water with salt or starting cultures used. 
Yeah, it's crazy how simple it is, really. But fermentation is when these bacteria or fungi or naturally present enzymes in the vegetables or, or whatever you're fermenting, they transform the food that they're in. It's this natural phenomenon that's been around long before humans have. And breaking down the food does a few things besides just preserve the food. Yeah, like it makes certain foods less toxic. I mean, even healthy foods have toxins, which we'll talk about soon. But it, it definitely makes certain foods more delicious. And even more importantly for us today, it makes them more digestible. Right, Jess? Right. And fermenting begins the process of digestion before the food hits your lips, which can make the nutrients in your foods more available for absorption. You can ingest huge amounts of nutrients, but unless you actually absorb them through your GI tract, they're useless. So when you improve digestion, you improve absorption. Absolutely. I know that's like a strange concept to grasp at first when you don't really know how we get nutrients from food. You see, we depend on our small intestine to allow nutrients to pass through the intestinal walls and and make it to our bloodstream. And then the nutrients have to go through all these different pathways to be utilized properly. And there's so many places for things to go wrong there. So if you're thinking you're eating a super healthy diet, but then your GI tract is damaged or compromised in some way or something is going on with those different pathways where you use nutrients, you, you may not be getting very many of the nutrients from your diet. Precisely. And during fermentation, the beneficial bacteria produce certain necessary nutrients for us, including B and K vitamins, B1, B2, B3. Levels increase in most fermentations compared to the raw food and all sorts of sciencey sorts of compounds and vegetables, like glucocyanates in cabbage and enzymes are produced that actually help to prevent disease. Yeah, a lot of stuff is going on during fermentation. I mean, even the minerals are becoming more available and certain difficult to digest compounds are broken down, making it easier for us to digest them. Like this tough proteins in grains and soy, like gluten and lectins, these proteins are not digestible by the human stomach. So the bacteria need to break them down for us into the components they're made up of, amino acids. And since we don't have gizzards like chickens and birds do, the gizzards break down those tough seeds and grains. We we don't have that. So we really need to ferment or soak or sprout these seeds and grains to make them more digestible. And when we ferment them, some of that work is done for us. This actually reminds me of sourdough. Sourdough bread is fermented, right? Oh, exactly. Now, not the cheap stuff. Not not the store-bought bread aisle imitation sourdough. You got to get your sourdough from a bakery that gives it time to ferment and come alive how true sourdough is made. I mean, it should take several days to make that bread. And they usually have a story to go along with it. They're really proud of it. Like they may use a starter culture that they've passed along for generations or they've even cultivated themselves and taken care of and and used creativity to achieve the perfect flavor and balance that they want. That's what we want to look for. And many people find that sourdough is easier on their digestion. Even if they have a gluten sensitivity, they can sometimes tolerate sourdough. So it's pretty amazing what fermentation can do. I know, right? I mean, now those pesky glutens and lectins aren't even the only toxins that you're trying to break down. Inside the seeds of grains and and beans and legumes and nuts, there are these compounds called phytates that bind to minerals in the food that you're eating and in our GI tract and block our absorption of those minerals. And we're talking like magnesium and calcium and iron. But during fermentation, the enzymes release those minerals from that phytate bond and help us absorb them from the food. Fermentation even reduces oxalic acid or oxalates, which again, bind to minerals and they can cause kidney stones. I mean, fermentation can even reduce pesticides. 
We should also mention how fermentation breaks down casein, a milk protein in dairy products. Casein is one of the most difficult proteins to digest. The proteins are digested twice as quickly when it's fermented or cultured. So culturing like yogurt actually restores many of the enzymes destroyed during pasteurization, including lactase, which is the enzyme we need to digest lactose, a milk sugar that most people can't digest today. So you see fermented and cultured foods really transform what we're eating and what our body is capable of. Mm-hmm. Amen to that. Most people think that probiotics are the major benefit of eating yogurt or other fermented or cultured foods, but that's just one benefit of the fermentation process. As you can see, like we've explained. Now, if you, if you heat your foods or cook them past 115 degrees Fahrenheit, um, then, then we're not going to have those live probiotics anymore. They're killed by the heat. Does that mean we're not getting any benefits from it? We might as well throw it out? No. The cool thing is that science shows us that there are so many benefits even when we cook with the fermented food. Those probiotics are still doing something that benefit our gut and that transform the food. And now you're starting to get an idea here how many things are actually happening. It really is amazing what fermented foods can do. I mean, not only do they boost your immunity and they aid in digestion, but basically like what we were saying this whole time is the fact that it helps you absorb other nutrients too. It's just fascinating. Yeah, we don't even think about where to apply this because it's just we weren't raised that way or we don't understand the whole science behind it. Or It's not even science because ancient humans weren't depending on science. They were just just depending on their instincts and, and natural wisdom. But I wrote this blog post called The Truth About Overnight Oats, and it's become my by far my most popular blog post. Now, if you're familiar with overnight oats, it's typically where you'd soak the oats in water or milk of any kind overnight. You wouldn't have to cook it. You would just cover it and refrigerate it, and by morning you could eat it the next day, right? Well, in my post I explained that we shouldn't be soaking our oats overnight in the refrigerator we should be soaking them in warm water at room temperature or even warmer because the bacteria love that. And, and then cooking the oats afterwards is actually a better idea because it makes it even more nutritious. It's not a food that you want to eat raw. No matter what the bloggers and vegans are telling you about overnight oats, you do not want to eat that food raw. You see, our ancestors knew this. They ate whole grains that were soaked or fermented. You know, over time, they figured out that this is just how grains need to be prepared in order to avoid illness and to help their people become stronger. It was maybe by accident they figured that out because they didn't have any refrigerators. You know, food was just left out. Interestingly, the oatmeal boxes way back in the day used to actually tell you on the instructions to soak the oats overnight. Now, not in a refrigerator, okay? <laughs> We've completely lost touch with this wisdom from our ancestors. We have this like huge fear of aging any food outside of the refrigerator. Am I right? I mean, most oh, people don't even <laughs> most people don't even realize they could leave like cucumbers mixed with a salad dressing out at room temperature. Like that's really where this fermentation begins. It's pretty cool. And because we've been raised to view bacteria as dangerous enemies, and you have to put things in the refrigerator, we kind of like lost touch with this and we're no longer curious, but with just a little bit of curiosity and interest, we can see there are so many advantages that we're missing out on. And, And that's why I made that post because you'll see that the oatmeal can finally become healthy like you think it is. I know you're eating it because you think it's healthy. It it can finally become healthy if you soak it overnight the old-fashioned way. And I teach you how to do that and make a killer recipe with cinnamon and pecans and butter and bananas. And you can find that at mylongevitykitchen.com. Just search overnight oats. You'll find it that way or you'll see it on the homepage. And many people wonder if probiotics or sauerkraut give you increased digestive issues. Like if you have bloating or candida overgrowth, will it make it worse? And the key here is to start very small with your doses and exposure and just work your way up. 
So you still want those beneficial bacteria to help you get through whatever you're dealing with, but you have to take it slowly to build up your tolerance. So consider looking further into your symptoms to learn if you might be showing signs of SIBO, which is a condition where bacteria starts to invade the small intestine where it doesn't belong. You know, we want bacteria in our large intestine. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you extra bloated and gassy? Then you probably have some SIBO going on. It's extremely common and it's just a new, I guess you could say, concept that's being more widely accepted now in, in gastroenterology or maybe we just all have it. I don't know, but I had it. It's really common. Um, I think that's an episode we'll have to tackle one day, SIBO, S-I-B-O. But for now, people can learn a lot about that in my story on episode number 11, where we talked about the low FODMAP diet. Now, regarding candida overgrowth, that's an overgrowth of natural yeast in our body. People worry about consuming fermented foods with that too. But the main place you want to focus to fix that issue is reducing your carbohydrates and your sugar because that's what the candida fungus love to eat. So feeding them what they love means they're going to continue to overpopulate your gut and rule the show. Now you probably have to cut out alcohol and beer and sometimes even vinegar and kombucha um, because they do include the same fungus or yeast that you're trying to starve off when you're getting rid of candida. Um, you would want to focus on lacto-fermented foods like sauerkraut, uh, vegetable fermentations, even yogurt, uh, especially if it's made uh, homemade yogurt. Um, anything that's raw and alive will be far more beneficial and have the right cultures that you need. Exactly. So now let's talk about some of our favorite fermented foods. Mm -hmm. I am obsessed with yogurt bowls. I like to put yogurt, which is going to be fermented milk, in a bowl with like cinnamon roasted veggies, like butternut squash, and maybe like a drizzle of nut butter on top. Honestly, it tastes like dessert. Whoa. I never <laughs> thought of putting butternut squash in my yogurt bowl. So you're, good. You're creative. I like that a lot. I actually put beets in my yogurt bowl. That was a really good move. And everyone was like, oh, my God. I posted on Instagram and they were like, what are you doing? I told them, you got to try it with granola. It was slamming. I mean, yeah. in our house, we make these yogurt bowls with paleo granola. So it's all like nuts and coconut and low sugar, but it's really, really good. I mean, that's how granola should be, you guys. But anyways, I put the yogurt in a bowl with paleo granola and some raw local honey. And when we're doing low carb, I just swap the honey for stevia drops and fresh or frozen berries. I'll even stir in some like vanilla protein powder if I want. Um, but just, I think we need to tell them what kind of yogurt they should get. We do. So you want to make sure you get plain, full fat, unsweetened yogurt from organic and grass fed cows. And Greek yogurt is also good as long as it's fitting that description. And goat and sheep yogurt are really great options too. Oh, and kefir. Kefir is a really good habit to get into because it's fermented or cultured differently than yogurt, and it's even easier on our digestion. So tons of benefits there for your gut, for your skin, and your immunity. Kefir is like a drinkable yogurt. You actually want to stay away from ones with sugar because you don't want to feed the bad bugs in your gut at the same time. And you could add your own raw honey or stevia or even blend it into smoothies. Mm. So now we can't talk about our favorite fermented foods without talking about sauerkraut, right? Mm. I love sauerkraut. Thank I add you. it to my morning scrambled eggs, and sauerkraut is going to be fermented cabbage. So it's really important to buy unpasteurized versions since pasteurization is going to kill that good bacteria. So that means no shelf-stable sauerkraut from the grocery aisles. You want it from the refrigerated section or from a farmer's market. A brand that I love is called Farm farmhouse culture. I could see people like cringing their face right now if they <laughs> don't know why we are saying sauerkraut is yummy. You guys, sauerkraut is the most nutritious and easy to introduce fermented food there is. And I'm going to tell you how versatile it is. I mean, even if you have kids, okay, listen up. If you are not currently into sauerkraut and you are like, these girls are crazy. Let me tell you, this is not the sauerkraut you're thinking of. This is not the kind you've had in like a ballpark bratwurst or in German food. The kind I'm talking about 
is crunchy, cold, and bright, and tangy, and made with only cabbage and sea salt and water. Okay, this is not going to have that classic sauerkraut taste that you remember from German food or bratwurst because these are made without caraway seeds. Caraway seeds are what give it that, that German sort of, I don't know, classic sauerkraut that you think of. So I want you to take a stroll down to the vegan cooler at your supermarket where the sauerkraut usually is. You're going to be sure to find all sorts of jars and bags of artisanal sauerkraut and different flavors and creations. I know here in the Midwest, a lot of the brands I see are called the Brinery, Bubbies, that's the one I buy all the time, Um, Farmhouse Culture are the ones in the bag you were talking about, Wild Brain makes crazy flavors. Um... It's awesome. It's so fun to explore. And you're also going to see jars of kimchi in there. And kimchi is a spicy Korean version. We absolutely love kimchi in my house and we eat it often. We just love those big flavors like chili and garlic. And I encourage you to just try different brands, try different flavors because you may like one and totally dislike another. Right, Jess? Right. It's incredible to see all these really different products on the market now like you said all the different flavor profiles it's really fun so if you don't like one like marisa said you might like another one and just become obsessed with it yeah and and before we get off the topic of sauerkraut i just want our (laughs) listeners to know how easy it is to add to your meals every single meal i mean in my house we always add sauerkraut to tacos even if i'm like getting it from like the Mexican place down the street. I'm not talking about homemade tacos, like spending all this time. I'm saying I just enhance the food that I'm eating and the nutrition by adding this crunchy, cold, briny sauerkraut on top of my tacos, on our sandwiches, definitely on our burgers, in our lettuce wraps. I chop it up and mix it into tuna salad and egg salad. I put it on top of boiled eggs like you're making deviled eggs. I mean, we even eat it as a side dish. I love it with my breakfast, like you were saying, Jess. And one of the easiest ways to start sneaking it in for your entire family is to try my probiotic guacamole recipe. So that one's at mylongevitykitchen.com too. You can just type guacamole in the search box. It's such an easy way to start using it. Oh, I love that. I mean, you had me a guacamole. I feel like that's just a perfect way to add sauerkraut into your diet if you're really just starting off, right? Right. So do you ever use miso paste, Marisa? Miso, yes, I have some in my fridge right now. Well, miso is going to be fermented soybean paste that obviously is known for miso soup, but there's so much more than you can do with it. I think my go-to is just a really easy miso dressing. I'll mix the miso paste with a little bit of almond butter and warm water. It's perfect for salads and stir fries. Dang, doesn't get any easier than that. I just made a dressing too the other day and just water, you know, Miso is really, really, really salty and umami and has like a strong, intense, concentrated flavor, which is awesome and most people love. But adding water is such a a great way to stretch it out and make it more palatable. And so all I did was water, vinegar, garlic, and oil, and boom, that's it. Salad dressing, home run. So simple. I love that. So you'll find miso in the same vegan or sauerkraut cooler at your supermarket. Just be sure to buy organic because soybeans are genetically modified. And even when they're not, they're also doused in chemicals. So organic Mm -hmm. is definitely the way to go. And the miso tubes look really big, but they last for like a year even after you open it. So go for it. Good tips. You know, In that cooler at the supermarket, you are going to find all kinds of goodies. Like they now have these squeeze bottles with fermented kimchi and jalapeno paste that's like blended up, you know, kimchi or sauerkraut, like blended up in a squeeze bottle. It's awesome to just add while you're making the salad dressing to get that fermented food hit. Um, I'll add it when I'm making homemade burgers or meatloaf and um, I'll mix it with mayo when I want condiments for burgers and wraps and stuff like that. It's, it's an easy way to get fermented foods in and add so much flavor from onion and garlic because they have a really strong onion and garlic flavor. And then you don't need to chop up onions and garlic and you still get all that flavor. And also in that cooler, you've probably seen these, just those drinkable fermented juices. I think they're called gut shots. Have you seen those? Yes. yes they're definitely. pretty awesome. You could just take a shot a day. Like if you're one of those people that's like, this is ridiculous. I'm not going to start buying sauerkraut and kimchi 
and I'm not going to start making all these new foods. My family's never going to eat them. Then this is an easy way to start doing it every morning. You're just taking a shot or every afternoon. Maybe you don't want the taste of like pickle juice in your mouth in the morning, but <laughs> they come in all different flavors. I think it's really fun. I like the spicy ones it, and it's, you can make salad dressings with that, add it to your guacamole. There's so much you can do. It really is fun to utilize those gut shots if you're just incorporating fermented foods just because, you know, say for example, you were to introduce it to your whole family. It's like, Oh, every day, like right before dinner, <laughs> we're all going to take this shot together. Like just, have fun <laughs> with it, you know, that would be fun. Yeah. So next I wanted to talk about kombucha. So kombucha sounds really weird at first, but it's a fermented tea and it's great if I'm craving something bubbly like soda or even as a way to just enjoy happy hour with friends while I'm trying to stay sober curious and just drink a little less. (laughs) That is such a good idea. And when I went to Boulder, Colorado, they have like kombucha at every bar on the menu they make them in-house they have them on tap it's pretty cool so I definitely did that when I didn't want to drink any alcohol and I love kombucha you guys you have to be willing to just try it and try different brands and different flavors because they are all so so different am I right so different and you know I'm not gonna lie there are some that I do not like at all but there are some that I'm obsessed with and I would buy it over and over again. I know. Some of them are fizzy, which I need in a kombucha, and some of them are sweeter, which is obviously an awesome place to start if you're not into kombucha yet. You have to explore the entire category. I mean, it's. I just had one the other day that was Pink Lady Apple with Basil, and yeah. it was such a home run. I can't tell you. It was so good. And they have a new watermelon one I have to try. I mean, you will foster a taste for kombucha, and sauerkraut and everything we're talking about here and you're going to find yourself craving them more and more it's like an adult soda pop and a great way to wean off of any soda or carbonated drink problem that you might be struggling with Mm -hmm. and this reminds me i've gotten a question before what if i buy it and i hate it i don't want to waste money on that or it's expensive well i tell people the best part about fermented foods is that we have this innate desire to eat these foods we just have to develop and grow to love it I I sound like a mom like trying to tell her kid to eat broccoli right now but I'm serious it's (laughs) It's so true it's like you will in a very short amount of time I would say in as little as six days you will grow a taste for this if you just hate a certain flavor that you purchased I know what that's like it's happened to me before and you can throw it into a cooked dish for instance like when this happened one time, I got a sauerkraut flavor that was gross. I just added it to stuffed peppers. I, people are afraid to cook with it, but but culturally, people, um, ancient people have done this forever and still doing it today. And like they do, Koreans do this with kimchi, for instance. If your kimchi is over fermented, it's old, you've had it for too long. It's not gross. Like it doesn't spoil like like regular food spoils but it gets really mushy and far too tangy to eat so you just chop it up and you add it to something like kimchi jjigae which is korean kimchi stew so i do that all the time i'll just throw chop it up and throw it in a soup that i'm making and it's so good and i'll add that chopped up sauerkraut that i didn't like into a mixture for like stuffed peppers or something yum that sounds so good and you know if it's a kombucha flavor that you dislike. You can always freeze it into ice cubes and add it mm. to smoothies or just keep it in the refrigerator and add a, s- a splash to your smoothie every time. You know, fermented foods, they are absolute superfoods, loading your gut with good bacteria. They're fighting off disease. They help your body just function optimally. And that's why they should be a part of your daily diet. Right, Marisa? Oh, for sure. Get started today. Your family and your brain and your body are like begging you for it, right? Definitely. So thank you so much for listening. Share this with a friend or a family member who you think needs to incorporate more fermented foods in their diet. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.